about Malix and um, I'm I'm not uh, I did four semesters uh, Chinese but um, I'm not very good at Chinese but I was told that May means something like beautiful in Chinese so I have no insights into Chinese but maybe can give you some insights into Malix oh this is my name this is my email this is my Twitter um, so where to start maybe start here uh, looks familiar so you have like this typical Ubuntu or uh, Debian style uh, boot up screen uh, that we customized for Malix. Uh, you can install uh, the system on your hard drive, you can uh, run a live CD and but that's actually not the approach we want to take. So what's special about Malix is not uh, that it's just another Linux distribution or just another customized Linux distribution but uh, it basically starts with a use case it's a desktop application uh, desktop distribution it's very special and for a very special purpose and the purpose is in short think of a conference organizer like FOSS Asia and want to set up in a conference space 100 internet terminals and there should always be the same software on each device we have certain requirements for a public computer where you could access the internet so in in the center stands the use case in this case and we reuse all existing technology we try not to invent too much on our own uh, we choose a very chose a very simple uh, desktop environment that is LXQT um, we reused uh, the original build scripts from Lubuntu before Lubuntu was existing um, as a starting point and uh, try to really work on just these small and feasible configuration items that are relevant for our use case and always try to uh, turn development onto the use case to satisfy uh, the user needs for this special uh, desktop purpose and the idea of the development is that we um, apply continuous integration so we try to uh, every time there's a change we, we build the system again and we really have this kind of approach of, of an agile and use case driven development uh, process so um, there are actually there's actually not only Malix but the important other tool is the Malix configurator customizer this is a very uh, minimum viable product it's a web app uh, running a container and basically uh, ask you for your email you can say what's the name of the event to pop up when you open a browser on this uh, customized machine and you can upload a wallpaper that's like the wallpaper of your conference these are just example settings uh, for for the proof of concept of course we want to add all the other features necessary for a configurator uh, what happens then uh, you press the build button and then yeah then you get an email I thought it was later, but Tarun told me it was 10 minutes later you get an email and this is the email with the ISO build so you download an ISO image and then you can install it on the different machines and the idea here is to keep it very simple in a way that uh, the person who actually creates this customized distribution doesn't have to care for the technical details doesn't have to run any build scripts doesn't have to um, know much about technology just has this web interface and everything else works in the background the Malix as such where you run the build script uh, for the distribution yourself and this is almost similar to say what your distributors do when they um, compile a new release of their of their distribution of their, their software um, right um, so what we found important in the process and uh, when we evolved all the different people is to follow the FOSS Asia guidelines for software development uh, using existing infrastructure using infrastructure that is easy to maintain so we don't have much administrative overload uh, reusing existing tools like using Jitter for communications this is just simple because we can use it as a as an external service 
use Jitter for the bug trackers and so on, so we don't have to maintain any infrastructure. And yeah, um, to try to, at least this was the stage where we always build. Um, and when we started to correct it, um, the other point was when we had um, our, our students working on the project and they solve tiny tasks, always um, encourage them to document how they solved it, what they did, and writing blog posts. And we found it in the Google Sum of Code process very, very important to encourage people when they contribute code, when they send their pull requests, also to write blog posts about what they did, um, how they solved it, what alternatives they considered, because this is very fruitful. And we discovered that the students that were very good at writing code were also the ones that were very good at writing blog posts, surprisingly. Because the stereotype, at least in Europe or in, in Germany, is uh, either you're a good coder or you're good at documentation. But in, in the first Asia sphere, it's a bit different. So, And um, the third thing, um, as an observation from the Mailing project, which is a bit like, uh, like a training ground also uh, for our developers from India mostly, um, is that we found it very important with a larger team to just walk through the code, too much legacy code from 2012, and look, what is it actually about? And uh, walk through the code together, jointly, and uh, using teleconferences, and uh, just trying to improve our common understanding of what's going on, and what may be obsolete, and what's uh, actually applicable. So here are some links. Um, there's, there are like three repositories. One is for the Mailix. The Mailix as such for, for building it. These are simple uh, shell scripts uh, that, that pull together the, the packages. They open up a CH root uh, where some, some other software gets installed and some configuration happens. And uh, then we, we have in the Mailix uh, the generator branch that's important for for generation of this, um, taking this, this image for the, for the Mailix generator. Then we have the web app that's also exported uh, the Mailix generator as a separate repository. And the third one that was worked, not the last year, but the, the, year, the year even before, is the Mailix system log. Because when you have a, a desktop that you provide to a general audience, what you want is you want to lock the system down so that all the casual users that are coming with their different requirements, uh, their different interests, uh, their different languages, and so on, cannot destroy uh, the computer or, or play around in a way. So, um, and main discussion takes place on a Jitter channel in, in the FOSS Asia Mailix. So, um, how will we continue with the Mailix project? Uh, Tarun will go more into details, um, one of our developers. But uh, soon, but um, I think four, four projects, I would say, could be singled out and are relevant for the upcoming Google Summer of Code season. And one is uh, the roadblock project, like, you know, it's, it's more or less experimental code. It's not very beautiful code in any way, or may maybe partly because it's a configuration task, not too much code at all. But uh, one of the roadblock projects is, of course, we have used these old scripts from 2012, and quite useful to put this into productive use uh, to yeah, migrate everything to 64-bit. Uh, uh, this is now standard, and we have to do some, some modifications there. So someone has to work on that. And there are also some, some other um, blocking projects, like how to kill desktop notifications uh, and, and other details. The second project is something something new we want to do based on Mailix, but it doesn't matter whether it's the target platform is Mailix or just an ordinary Lubuntu with, with LXQT. But Mailix is like the reference platform for it, and this is Susi desktop integration. Uh, you had all these uh, talks about Susi, and Michael Christen can explain you the details on the conversational um, server and uh, all the different uh, clients that are right now available. But what we don't have yet is something in the Linux space comparable to Microsoft Cortana 
um, for Windows, like uh, desktop integration of uh, conversational features. And this also cannot totally protest on, on the server because all the different, all the clients are different. So we have to some kind of API to steer some desktop specific options um, by with a conversational interface and uh, provide some interface to, to get feature parity with uh, Siri, with Alexa, and so on. So all the hard work, uh, all the stuff in the background with the SUSE AI server is basically done, but now we have to put it more into use and uh, support the client-side features. And this is what this project is about, and we hope to get a, a Summer of Code student uh, who wants to work specifically on desktop integration. Um, so the, and the third project, of course, is to improve and expand the Mailix generator. Now that the basic, say, if you if you know how to configure uh, the wallpaper, then you can also configure everything else. Um, this then becomes uh, pretty trivial. So we want to expand uh, the features and make this new more useful. And there's an idea because right now the build process is pretty pretty ugly, using uh, a bit of a hackish uh, shell script to use a, a next generation build, uh, build process. And this is prototyped by Harsh in his um, fork um, of the Melix main repository. So um, I just had a look at it. I, I, don't, I don't know, I haven't tested it, and I don't know how much work it would be to actually make it work and a seamless replacement. But this looks like uh, the way to go from a technical side. So, uh, maybe you. <laughs> so. Huh? Oh, I got a good question. Oh, yeah, good. Uh, why desktop when everyone's moving to the phone? Why desktop when everyone's moving to the phone? Uh, that's, that's actually a good point. Um, I would say that the desktop still has a place. The desktop is still important. I mostly use uh, the desktop for, for all interactions. And I, I, I'm aware of the mobile hype. I'm aware of the mobile integration. But still, say, the Linux desktop is something that never happened. And the closest approximation to a system that works out of the box is actually, from my perspective, to go simple. And we did it a few years ago when we started with this LXDE project and try to try to get a more simple go into complexities that just provides the basic functionality and you say okay this is like a drop in replacement because right now um, public administrations they are not going to tablets they're still using desktop computers and they will continue to do so for all their for all their services but say uh, public administrations they were considering to switch to linux and there was a time where where i could say yeah uh, let's try it, let's do it, uh, let's migrate to Linux, but right now you cannot say this anymore. At least I wouldn't say, I wouldn't recommend a public administration to switch to Linux uh, on the desktop, simply because these desktop environments are too complex, not stable enough, and we had some, say, mi migrational disasters, so either your software gets completely outdated or, <laughs> or um, yeah. Uh, useless uh, or yeah, unstable and, and uh, dysfunctional. So I, I'm using the des uh, Linux desktop for, for ages, almost 20 years now, and I'm very satisfied with it, but I don't know if I would recommend it to someone else. So what's really important is to keep it very focused and in a way, say for me the perfect, for me the perfect desktop is like like the perfect servant. A perfect servant is a, is a servant that you don't even notice. You just see, oh, there's a glass of water exactly in the moment when I want this glass of water. And when you talk too much about the desktop and are too concerned about all the features and so on, and not even notice the desktop, then something, something goes wrong. But I, I, I guess, say, for, for a general user who's also uh, experienced in this Microsoft sphere, I, I think uh, LXQT is, is a quite good approximation as a desktop. So this, this is a software I would right now recommend. Or, or to go with Cinnamon, of course. Uh, 
Um, I have a question for would you recommend that we use this ourselves as our own desktop? Because if there are, I have very serious concerns. One of them is how do you reconcile things like Broadcom Wi Fi drivers, NVIDIA GPU drivers, uh, graph, if you have other distros on your machine? And, uh, because the reason why I'm asking that is I actually have a distro with me, I installed it back. And almost everything had to be installed by command line. There was not a single I even if I wanted to say go to a Taiwan update server, I couldn't do that. I couldn't do that. I had to do it by command line. There's nothing I could do from there's no graphical user interface to do anything in the administration Right. Um, I I guess this is a general a general question that applies to all Linux distributions in a way. Um, some, some, some are very friendly, some work out of the box, uh, sometimes don't work out of the box. Personally, I think uh, if I can get some uh, command line solution, it's, it's better for me. I, I don't want any graphical installers or so, simply um, because when you think of a support context, when you support a user and tell him how to install a driver, and you, you just give him, give him the instructions for the command line. It's something like, OK, use this shortcut, fire up a terminal, and enter these three commands. And what will be the output? Or um, you, you uh, type in this command, uh, what, what does it show to you? This is good for, good for interaction for, um, for customer support. But if you have graphical interfaces, I mean, try to explain your mom on the telephone uh, and then you have to click the button there in the menu so and so uh, it's it's really it's it's horror to um, to do uh, to do remote support on graphical user interfaces and uh, solving all the issues uh, so personally i prefer very much uh, the idea of uh, command line interfaces for configurations if there has to be something configured um, and yeah, the, the other, uh, and, and regarding, say, of, of hardware, um, I mean, this is not genuine to the platform. Uh, say, if you buy a computer in a shop with Windows pre-installed, then it's in the responsibility of the hardware manufacturer to make it run on that machine, and it probably works because it shipped with it. Okay. Um, on the other hand, I have uh, problems when you run um, older hardware, when you run hardware that's not certified for your machine or that was certified for the previous reason, for the previous machine, especially when you try to use older printers with newer machines. At times, uh, the printer manufacturers, they don't want to support uh, the new operating system and you run into troubles. And just, just an example of from my practice, um, say I, I, I wrote, uh, I got Bluetooth headphones. So uh, you cannot operate them on, under Windows 10. You cannot operate them with Mac OS. And with Linux, it was very hackish and complicated to get it, get it work. But now it works. And then there was a kernel update, and now it works seemingly out of the box. So, so I guess that the, the Linux approach still is the best because you have such a variety and such a richness of hardware support. Um, the, to the point with Melix is that our users shouldn't have to do anything with system configuration. So if, if this system doesn't work on a, on, a, on a box that we put somewhere, um, then there's a problem with this box, so then we cannot proceed with this. But this is just uh, just a use case for um, for development. I wouldn't recommend right now to use Melix for productive reasons in any way. But um, thinking about the use case, working on the use case means um, thinking about in this specific context, what do users need? Like uh, when you have this for the conference space, then you come up with different requirements that you usually don't have, like support of multiple languages. If you have an international conference, some speakers will be Japanese, some will be Chinese. So we have to have uh, Japanese and Chinese out of the box. And uh, 
the next person that comes is a Spanish citizen. So um, these are very special requirements. Or maybe you want to block certain websites um, and a block list uh, so th they don't use your conference space to access certain websites that may be inappropriate in a, in a context. You wouldn't, ha wouldn't want to have this at home, of course. But uh, say in a conference space, I understand that there should be some blocking of some services and so on. So very uh, deriving from the use case, uh, what do we need in order not to confuse users, in order not to uh, create uh, too much overhead? Um, uh, technically, um, Melix is right now, I know there, there are some, some in the projects who are very much into Arch Linux, but um, it's basically built on a, on a Debian or Ubuntu infrastructure, so uh, we don't even uh, we don't even take our own kernel. So we even take the Ubuntu kernel, which technically doesn't even make it a distribution, <laughs> because if you don't compile your own kernel, then it's no distribution, as you know. But uh, that that's not the real case. The real case is the use case and to trying to develop all the configurations so everything get, things get set up out of the box and uh, the special needs of a user are satisfied here. And yeah, why not, why not a mobile phone uh, actually say in these conference spaces where you have like these internet terminals um, or in a hotel, this was the other use case. Um, Malix was previously called Hotelos so the idea was yeah, to create a distribution for, um, for, uh, for hostels and, and for, for these purposes. So, uh, but, but this is basically the same a device, a desktop that is accessed by multiple persons temporarily, uh, persons who don't own the computer, um, persons who just use it for minutes and want to leave no traces there. Um, you have to provide some security and, and so on. And um, settings shouldn't confuse users in any way. So no pop-ups in, in, in Chinese and uh, no, no bullshit. Hello. Yeah. Uh, I'm new to Melix. I didn't know what it was about. I think I'm missing some of the context. Okay. What is the use case? For yeah. That? Maybe maybe uh, uh, Tarun can. <laughs> okay. Maybe later we just, can just get okay. get into the details. <laughs> but I uh, I uh, guess that by your words that this is a Ubuntu Debian derivative. Yeah. So would you consider registering as a Debian derivative? The, they have a in Debian they, we have some forms. Yeah. You can register. You run your own repositories as well, or? Or software packages or well yeah the software is right now mostly in experimental stage but we have say dedicated uh, packages of course but they some of them don't adhere to the the Debian standards yet as someone pointed out so we also have to work on that but that's okay that's if you want to get the packages in Debian no no we don't want that but we had the you discussion you can have register as a derivative yeah yeah uh, um, but but actually, I, I guess right now we have no no users other than the developers, because yeah, we were still working on this project for also as a kind of educational project, uh, or for trying out some some stuff how to build um, build from from an app um, using automated services building uh, ISO images, and that's that's kind of the fun. Yeah, I do that. So you you, you want to talk with me afterwards? After yeah, yeah, talk? yeah. I might be able. We might be able to. Okay. So. <laughs> uh, um. Wait. I think I have to.